Are you ready for the word? Okay, we've been teaching on understanding your assignment in the last two messages. We'll focus upon your assignment as a saint. We talk about professing that you are a saint. We talked about uh, pursuing holiness last, last, last week. And today I want to look at what I'm calling practical holiness or the practice of holiness. Now, what is our definition for you as a saint? We said that every believer is a saint, correct? Correct? All right. And that means if you are in Christ, you are a holy man or a holy woman of God. It means that you have been set apart by God for God. Say by God. For God. By God. For God. You have been set apart, set apart by God for God to live an uncommon life for his glory. See, I have, in Christ, been set apart by God for God to live an uncommon life for his glory. So that's your identity. That's who you are. Now, it's one thing, however, to know or to be a saint because God has declared you to be one and God has made you one, it's one thing for that to be your identity, it's another thing for you to actually walk in, live in, and live as a holy person. It's one thing to be holy, as you are if you're in Christ, and another thing to live victoriously over sin, to live as an overcomer over the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's, it's one thing to be who you are in Christ. It's another thing to so walk and so live that that which is on the inside, that which you are, is manifesting on the outside, and you're literally experiencing what it means to be an overcomer over sin, over the world, over the flesh, and the devil, such that people can look at your life and see Christ in you, right? But that's where we want to be. All of us who are in Christ, we want to be in that place where people see Christ in us, but in the way we live, in our attitudes and our actions. We want to be in that place where we are literally experiencing the victorious overcoming life of Christ. And so today, I want us to look at that as we ask ourselves, what does it take? What do I need to do? Because I am, as you said, Bishop, I am holy, I accept that, but I'm still not experiencing victory. How do I, on a daily basis, so live? What does it take? What actions do I need to take in order to experience the overcoming life? That's the question that we're gonna answer for you today. And I want us to do so by looking at a familiar text, Romans chapter 12, verse one and two. And we're gonna read these two verses, and in these two verses, in a very succinct manner, Paul, by the Holy Spirit, reveals to us how we as saints can then begin to live out this life that Christ has called us to live on a daily basis. Let's read it together. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And, again, let's read together, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, that word prove literally means so that you can actually experience, okay, demonstrate for yourself what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Say God's will for my life is good. God's will for my life is acceptable. God's will for my life is perfect. Come on, say that. God's will for my life is good. It is acceptable and it is perfect. So since it's good, acceptable, and perfect, I want to experience it. I want to actually walk in it. And this is 
what we're being told to do. Now, say to do. That's an action word, okay? And many times in our relationship with God, we tend to focus on what we must do. But Paul did not begin with what you must do. He actually began with what you must know and believe before he told you what to do. The mistake that we make so often in our Christian life is we begin with doing when we ought to begin with knowing. We ought to begin with believing. Are you hearing me? Because this is the pattern in the New Covenant, and this is the pattern that Paul uses in the epistles. Doctrine before duty. Faith before works. Believing before behaving. That's the pattern. In, 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 in the Old Covenant, or those who are legalistic in their approach to holiness, they're not concerned about doctrine, and they're not concerned about believing. What they're concerned about is about doing. And so the focus for them, when it comes to holiness, is that you gotta do this, you don't do this, you do that, and they jump over the believing part, they jump over the knowing part, they jump over doctrine. And as a result, their efforts at holiness is fleshly, it's legalistic, and it focuses on a lot of rules. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Things which Paul says are powerless when it comes to sin. All right? So then, I want you to pay attention to that little word, but with big and significant implications. Go back to verse 1. I beseech you, therefore. Say therefore. therefore. Now we know from our basic English class that whenever you see a therefore, we're taught to ask, what is it there for? Because whenever you see a therefore, it suggests that what is about to follow is the logical conclusion that we have reached in light of what has gone before. So what Paul is saying to us here is that I'm about to tell you to take some actions. I'm about to tell you to do some things, but the only reason I can tell you now to do this thing is because of what I have already told you. So you're not ready to do what I'm about to tell you until you know and understand and believe what I have already told you. Now, therefore, there are 11 chapters that preceded Romans chapter 12, which means Paul told us a lot of things that he wants us to know, believe, before we get into Romans 12 and start to take action. Say to your neighbor, doctrine before duty, faith before works, Believe before behave. What a lot of people don't understand is what you believe is going to determine how you behave. So if you are behaving wrong, it's because somewhere in your believing, you are believing wrong. So if I want to change your behavior permanently, I need to change what you're believing permanently. And so Paul took 11 chapters to tr change what we are believing about ourselves, about God, and about righteousness. And when you read the 11 chapters, you'll find him saying, oh, I wish my brethren, the Jews, would be righteous. But they're ignorant of God's way of making people righteous, and so they're trying to establish their own righteousness. But the truth is, Paul re reveals, our righteousness is by grace through faith. And so Paul took 11 chapters to show us that we are 100% righteous. What percent? And by the way, there are only two positions, just like a, your, your light switch, on and off, is either on and off. 
You can only be 100% righteous or 100% unrighteous. You can only be 100% holy or 0% holy. There's no such thing as being 50% holy, 70% holy, or 50% righteous. You're either right or you're not right. You're either right with God or you're not right with God. You can't be 75% right with God. Are you hearing me? So Paul took 11 chapters to say, you know what? Guess what? Because of Jesus and because of what Jesus has done, you are now 100% right with God. In spite of your performance, God has done something in Christ. You are righteous. He took these chapters and when you read them, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. He takes this and he said, listen, you are a blessed people who are in Christ because you are the ones to whom God is no longer imputing or charging sins. He says, sin will not have dominion over you anymore because henceforth in Christ, you live and you're under grace and not the law. He says in Romans 8, hear me, nothing will separate you from God's love. Nothing, not even your sins can separate you anymore from God. He says in all of these things that you face, you are more than conquerors because of Christ and because of him who loves you. So for 11 chapters, he teaches and explains to us how we are righteous, 100% righteous, how we're forgiven, 100% forgiven, how God is no longer angry with us. He does that. And he shows us how in Christ Jesus, we have now become holy and we are now saints because of what Jesus done. Now, once you see that, you are now in the position, and he's now in the position to say to you, in light of this, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Are you listening to me? Here is a principle that we really, really need to grab a hold of. And here it is. Until God does something, or until God has finished his work, we cannot begin ours. Let me repeat. Until God finishes, we cannot start. Because it is what God does that enables us to do. Let me, let me give you an example. In Genesis chapter, chapter 1 with the creation story. We know God created man. On what day? Okay. <laughs> if you all don't know when God created man, we are in trouble. On what day did God create man? Day 6, okay? Not day 1, not day 2, not day 3, 4, 5, but on day 6. So God created man on day six, and man was the last of his creation, man and woman, the last of his creation, which means it was not until he had finished creating everything else that he created man. And then the very next day was a day of rest. So God finished his work, God took a whole day to rest, and all this time man was doing nothing. It was not until after he had rested on the next day that man went to work. You got to understand, until God finishes his work, we cannot begin ours. Doctrine before duty. Faith before works. Believing before behaving. Because until God does, we cannot do. And if you try to do before God does, you will end up being like the Pharisees. Proud Pharisees. Or miserable legalists. This is what Jesus said. Apart from me, you can do nothing. In other words, apart from my finished works, 
You can do nothing. You can do nothing about serving God or walking in holiness until Christ has finished his work. Oh, that's what the Bible says. We have to enter his rest. You see, he has to finish his work. He's resting, and then we enter into the reality of what he has done. When we enter into the reality of the finished work, then we are ready to do. Say, so apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from the finished, accomplished work of Christ, we can do nothing. That means you make a mistake. If you try to serve God or you try to live a God for God without grounding what you do on the finished work of Jesus, the Holy Spirit always, always begins his work in us where the work of Christ ends. I told the other folks when I said that you all need to raise my salary because that is powerful. Don't let it, don't let it go through one ear out. The Holy Spirit always, um, without exception, he always begins his work in us where the work of Christ ends. In other words, Christ and his accomplished work is always going to be the foundation upon which he builds anything in your life. So since that's where he starts, that's where you got to stand. You got to be firmly grounded in the finished work of Jesus. Let both feet be planted on the foundation of what Christ has accomplished for you on the cross. Amen? All that he has done by his blood, how he's washed you, how he's cleansed you, how he's made you righteous, how he's made you holy, how he's made you accepted, how he has made you the temple of God, how his spirit lives in you, how he has forgiven you, grounds your relationship with God in the finished work of Jesus because that is the foundation upon which the Holy Spirit builds and does anything in your life. Only one foundation has been laid. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, the Holy Spirit always begins his work in you where Christ has finished his. Until he finishes, you can't start. So apart from that revelation, until you got that, until you got that, you are going to find yourself struggling. All right? So here is the first thing that God is saying to us as we seek now to put holiness into practice. He's saying, know what Christ has done for you. Embrace what Christ has done for you. Embrace your true identity in Christ as a child of God, a holy man, a woman of God, and never allow yourself to forget that because that's the foundation. When you are grounded in that, then you can take the next step, which is to present your body as a living sacrifice to God. Hear me, extremely important. If you are a married person, a husband or wife, and you want to live your life as a faithful husband, a faithful wife, one of the things you must never allow to happen is to forget that you are married. You must never, the biggest mistake you can make if you want to be faithful, is to forget that you are a married person, who you are married to, forget your identity as a husband and wife, and start to think that you are single again. Oh my goodness, you get into a certain environment, you're around a bunch of single people, and you forget that you are married, and you think you are like them, because you are in the same environment that they're in. The minute you forget you are married and start thinking you are single, you are in danger, and it's not going to be long before your marriage is in trouble. Knowing who you are as a married man or woman and never allowing yourself to forget that is critical if you're going to live as a married man or a married woman. That's why when you get married, we go through all kinds of things to ensure you never forget. <laughs> These people, 
just renewed their vows on Friday, right? 11 years. They were, they were reminding themselves. <laughs> After 11 years, let's do it again because we want to make sure we never forget because we got another 11 years to go through and if the years were like the ones that we just came through we, we better. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. But we go through this and we stand before the preacher or the judge and we repeat vows so we don't forget. We sign certificates so we don't forget. We invite witnesses to come and sign to make sure they can remind us I was there when you got married. Here is the evidence. Then we put on this thing called a wedding ring. I've been married for 36 years. I've been, I've been wearing this thing. It's not just jewelry. This is not jewelry. Because if I want a jewelry, I get something better. I'm wearing this. No, it was my wife made me put it on. <laughs> 36 years ago, and I made her put mine on 36 years ago. Why? Because she wants to make sure that I never, never forget that I am a married man and who I am married to and that I am no longer single or available. <laughs> Amen. You know, so she, she makes sure I have something that when I'm praying, I see it. When I'm driving, I see it. When I'm in an office with somebody else, I see it. And every time I see it is to say, I don't care what you feel. <laughs> I don't care how she looks. <laughs> I don't care what she's saying. Don't forget, you are married. And don't forget who you're married to. You are no longer single. Reminding myself has been critical to the fact that I've been faithful for 36 years. Yeah. <laughs> and as you know, I, I, I wear the ring, but you, you know, I usually take it off at night because I don't want to give my finger a little, because after a while it starts to change the color, you know, so I take it, take it off. So over the 36 years, I may have few times forgotten to put it on. Well, the minute she notices it, where's your ring? <laughs> Even though I've given her no reason to be suspicious, I've given her no reason to doubt my love, she says, you know what? Where is your ring? Because she doesn't want me to forget. And, I, and she doesn't want, I guess, anybody else to think. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But hear me, I'm making a very important point. If you're going to walk in holiness practically, the first requirement, the most basic requirement, is that you don't ever allow yourself to forget that you are holy. Amen. Amen. I don't care what the circumstances are, who's around you, the environment you're in, whether there's smoke in the air, liquor in the air, drugs in the air, all kinds of things that are being exposed to your eyes and your ears and no matter what you may be feeling and no matter what you may even say and sometimes you even trip and fall. Don't forget that even though you have fallen, you are a holy man, a holy woman of God. This is who you are. God forbid that I should ever commit adultery against my wife. God forbid. Amen? But should that ever happen, the thing that will cause me to come back and get it right is for me to remind myself, I am still a married man. The Bible says, don't sin. But if you ever sin, the thing that will cause you to come back and do the right thing is to remind yourself that even though I have sinned, I am still a saint, a holy man of God, and this is not who I am, this is not where I belong. Are you hearing me? So that you can walk out of that. But if you sin, and you say, because I've sinned, now I'm no longer a married man. I'm no longer holy. I'm no longer right. I'm no longer. The likelihood of you continuing down that path is so much greater. And that's why so many people who have sinned, you don't see them anymore. Because they thought when they sin, they cease to be holy. When they sin, they cease to be a, 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 a saint. And so they say, since I'm, I'm a sinner, I just as well go ahead and live like one. Because they are wrongly defining who they are by what they do. Are you listening to me? 
So that's why it's critical. That's why there's a therefore there because Paul is saying, in order to do what you're about to do, you got to begin not so much with doing, but with knowing and believing and allowing yourself never to forget what you know that has been revealed to you concerning what Christ has done for you. Never forget you've been washed in the blood. Never forget you're holy and blameless. Never forget you're righteous through Christ. Never forget that you are a saint. Embrace that every morning. And just like I wear a ring to remind myself I'm married, you do what you gotta do to keep reminding yourself that you're a saint. Amen. Amen. Read the word, meditate in the word, listen to sermons, go to places where, like church, where people remind you that you're a saint. Amen. Find friends who remind you that you're a saint. Never allow yourself to forget who you are. Everybody say, I am a holy man, woman of God, set apart for God to live an uncommon life for his glory. And I could add for your good because anything that is for his glory is for your good. All right, you got it? Once you're grounded now, then Paul says, now I can tell you what actions to take. He says, here's what you need to do, you who are saints, because, and you, have, you know that, and you've embraced that. Now, here's the thing you need to do. Present your bodies, let's read that together. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and some translations will say your reasonable act of worship. Present your bodies now. No, you you are you are you are holy, right? You are a saint. Well, I don't have the time to to, to break down what I call spiritual biology one hundred and one, but you know, or you should know, that you are spirit, soul, and body. Correct. Your spirit, which is eternal, is created, born again, recreated by God after the image of Him who created you. And the Scripture says He created you in righteousness and true holiness. Your spirit is perfect. Oh, you didn't hear me. Now, everything about you is not perfect. I can look at your body and tell there's some things that are not perfect. You can look at mine, right? So we know the body is not perfect and God has promised to replace it. Thank God in the future, this body is gonna be replaced with one that is perfect. Yeah. Amen, right now I need to take care of it as best as I can, but it has to be replaced. There's going to be a, a new one given to me. Amen. My spirit needed to be recreated. That has already been done. Finished. In the past, your spirit is recreated and was recreated after the image of God. Your spirit is perfect. Your spirit is, look, it's not, nothing is going to change when Jesus comes, when it comes to your spirit. It's already finished. You are new. Are you hearing me? The only thing that will change when Jesus comes is our bodies. Because he's already recreated the spirit. It's done. He's promised to replace the body. He will. But there's a third part of you, right? That's the soul. So the body is going to be replaced. The spirit has already been recreated. The soul, which consists of your mind, your will, and your emotions, your imaginations, your soul is being renewed. God has elected not to replace your soul, nor to recreate your soul, but to simply renew it. And next week I will tell you why. Why the soul doesn't need to be replaced or recreated, it simply needs to be renewed. Oh, hallelujah. So where does the Holy Spirit dwell? What part of you? In your spirit, right? It's in your spirit that the Holy Spirit dwells. But if God that is in your spirit, the whole of holiness, is gonna manifest himself outwardly where he can be seen and experienced on this earth, he's gonna need something physical to work through. So he's saying, listen, I'm already dwelling your spirit. Now I want you to present your body, the physical part of you, so that I can work through it and do my perfect will on earth through 
your body. So even though your body needs to be replaced, God can and does want to use your bodies now. That was weak. That was weak. All right? So here is an instruction. Present your body. So what are the saints supposed to do? The saint is supposed to, first of all, embrace his identity based upon the doctrines of the, of the new creation, the, the word of grace, the word of Christ. Then the saint is supposed to present his body a living, say that, living sacrifice. Say that, living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Now, I am almost convinced that as you read that, 99.9% .9 or maybe I, should, maybe I should make it, since this is Bethel, let me say 95%. Okay? 95% of those who read that, when they read it, the focus is upon holy, presenting your bodies holy and acceptable to God, and immediately they think with religious eyes, oh, in order for me to serve God, I need to make sure I am holy. I need to make sure I'm acceptable. I need to make sure I don't do this, don't do that, don't go here, don't wear this. I got to make sure to be holy. Touch not, handle not. Da, 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 da. I got to make sure I do things that are pleasing to God. Because if I don't, God won't use me. God won't accept my service. God will not accept my worship. I said 95% looking at your faces. I better go back to 99.9%. <laughs> That's how we read that, right? Most people will see that as another law to keep in order to qualify to be in his service. They will read that and see that as another standard I have to attain to. To make myself holy and acceptable to be in his reasonable service. Here's another obstacle I need to rise above. And so 99.9% .9 of the people do not see themselves as holy and acceptable and therefore they are not going to present their bodies to God because in their mind, they are not holy enough yet. They are not acceptable yet. And that's why there are many folks that are in our churches who are not presenting their bodies to the Lord because in their mind, I'm not holy enough yet. I'm not acceptable enough yet for God to use me. That's a lie of religion, another lie of the devil that is completely contrary to what Paul. Remember, Paul spent, oh my goodness, 11 chapters teaching you something, only to come in this chapter and reverse everything he just taught you. He took 11 chapters to tell you, God has watched you, made you holy, you are righteous in God's sight. And then he comes and just undo all of that and say, go back and try to be. No, look at that again. Let's read it again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by? By what? By what? Now, that phrase, by the mercies of God, is just shorthand. What Paul is saying, based upon and by the mercies of God, that I just took 11 chapters to talk to you about. By the mercies of God shown to you in Christ, which I have revealed to you for the last 11 chapters. By the mercies of God, by which you have been made holy and acceptable. Present now your bodies to God. Oh God. You didn't see it. You didn't see it. Let me repeat. What he's actually saying is, since by my mercies in Christ, I have made you 
holy. Since by my mercies in Christ that I've spoke to you about, I have made you acceptable. Since by the blood of Jesus, I've made you well-pleasing, and that's acceptable, well-pleasing to me. Since I have made you okay by the blood of Jesus, since I have separated you by the blood of Jesus and made you holy, since I have found you now in Christ to be well-pleasing to me, since I now find your body acceptable to me in Christ, Take what I have made acceptable. Take what I have made holy. Take what I have made very, very pleasing to me. Take what I have made mine reserved for me to be my temple. Take what I am now okay with in Christ, your bodies, and present them to me as an act of worship. Oh, hallelujah. May God open our eyes. May God open your eyes. Hear me, if you're in Christ, God is saying, now you're pleasing to me. In fact, you're well pleasing. Now you're holy to me. Now you're set apart for me. Now you're reserved for me. Now I, I find your body more than compatible with me. Now I find your body's okay to serve as my temple. Since this is the case, do with it what I qualified it for. Take it now, that which I have made holy and blameless and acceptable, and do what? Present it to me. Make your bodies that I have washed and cleansed and made holy a present to me. It can now become a sacrifice that I will receive because I have prepared for myself the sacrifice. Oh, no, no. It's not goats and bulls. No, I myself will prepare the sacrifice. So he prepared the sacrifice. His name is Jesus. And then in Jesus, he prepared us who are now one with Christ to be able to offer ourselves not dead sacrifices, but a living sacrifice. We take these bodies that he has made holy and blameless through the blood of Jesus. And we are to say, here it is. God, as an act of my worship, here is my present to you. Take this body and use it for the purpose for which you made it holy, for your glory. So instead of reading this and think, okay, okay, I got to go make myself holy. No, no, God is saying embrace the reality that I have made you holy and act upon that and present your body. Hear me, he and he alone can make you holy. It's only the blood of Jesus that can make you holy. You, can't, you cannot make yourself holy. Only the blood of Jesus can make you acceptable. You cannot make yourself acceptable. But the good news is he has with the blood made you holy and acceptable. He's done that. But there's one thing he's not going to do. He's not going to present you to himself. He said, I will, I've watched you. I've qualified you to be holy unto me. I've done that. I've invited you to be my temple. I've assured you that if you offer yourself to me as a present, I will accept you because you're accepted and beloved. Now the invitation is there. Now I'm going to wait for you to act upon the invitation and literally based upon your faith in what I have done to present your bodies to me and to say, Father, thank you for qualifying me in Christ. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for making me holy. Thank you for making my body now suitable for you, well-pleasing to you. And that's in spite of my performance. Lord, I take this body that you have made, and here it is. I offer it to you. Here are my hands. Use these hands to bring healing. Use these hands to serve. Use these hands to meet needs. 
Use these hands to praise and worship you. They are holy. Use them for your glory. Lord, take this mouth. You've cleansed it. You've washed it. You've purified my mouth with the blood of Jesus. Now, Lord, take this mouth that you have made holy and use it to speak your word. Use it to speak only that which is edifying. Use it to speak only that which will uplift and build up. Use that to, to, to speak only that which is the truth. Here it is. Use it for your glory. Use it to share this glorious gospel with those who have not heard it. It's holy I presented to you for your use. Lord, take my mind and take my talents and take my gifts and take my treasure and take my time. I offer it to you willingly as my reasonable act of worship. Say act of worship. Say reasonable. Reasonable. In other words, in light of what I've done in making you holy by my mercies, it is reasonable. It is proper. The proper thing to do now is to take what I have sanctified for myself, reserved for myself, made holy for myself, and present it to me. That's proper. Don't take what I've cleansed and washed and made holy and go and use it for uncommon purposes. That is not reasonable. That is not proper. It's not proper for me to take this body that God has qualified for his dwelling place and use it for anything other than his dwelling place. So it's reasonable. And it's, it's, it's reasonable not just because it's proper. It's reasonable because it's practical. It's practical. It's reasonable also because it's powerful. When you start to do this, it's powerful the kind of changes and transformations and things that God is able to do in you and through you. It's powerful. And it's reasonable because, hear me, it's possible. And it's possible because he who has begun a good work in you is going to perform it until the end. It's possible because he's working in you now both the will and do his pleasure. So sense is proper, sense is practical, sense is powerful, and sense is possible. Do it. Present your body that is already holy and blameless and acceptable and well-pleasing to him every day. Lord, here's my present. Here's my act of worship. Here is my sacrifice, a sacrifice. Why is it a sacrifice? Because you are giving up something that you have a right to, in a sense. In, in offering your body, you're giving up your right to use your body to please yourself. So it's a sacrifice, something of value, your right to use your body to please yourself, you're giving it up. But you're giving it up to gain something of greater value. And what is it? The privilege of having God live in you and to work through your body to please him. Are you willing to make the sacrifice? Are you willing to offer your bodies unto him as a living sacrifice, not a dead one? Are you willing to give up your right to do with your body what you please, something of value, a sacrifice? Give that up for something even more valuable, the privilege of having God live in you and do through you what he pleases. Wow. I am willing to have God live his life in me. I'm willing to exchange doing what pleases me for what pleases God. I am willing. That is so much greater, so much more significant. When God is doing things through me that pleases him, we're doing things that have eternal significance. It's a sacrifice. Are you hearing me? Hallelujah. What's the first thing I need to do? I need to know and believe. All that the scriptures have said concerning what Christ has done for me and who I am. And I need to embrace that as my identity. Never allow myself to forget that. Secondly, knowing these things, I need to do what's reasonable and proper. As an act of my worship, as reasonable service, present this holy body unto God. Completely and say, here it is. It's already holy. Wash in the blood. Lord, use it.
Then we go to verse 2. And in verse 2 we read, And do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So here's the next thing you do now. You who are a saint, you need to present your bodies. But you who are a saint, you also need to present your minds to be renewed. Now, this is what I'm going to focus on next week. Today I'm talking about practicing holiness. Next week I'm going to talk about perfecting holiness. And the perfecting of holiness involves the mind or the soul. I already talked about your soul. Amen? Because ladies and gentlemen, this is where you and I struggle. The, you may say, Bishop, you say I'm holy and blameless, but I'm still struggling with sin. How come I'm holy and blameless? You say I'm a new creature, I'm perfect, created in righteousness and true holiness. How come I'm still suffering and struggling with temptations? Where is it coming from? Why am I not walking in victory there? Here is the answer. There is no temptation that is affecting your spirit. Your spirit is not being tempted. Your spirit doesn't sin. The problem that you or I are facing is a problem that is taking place in the realm of the soul. Remember I told you the spirit has been recreated, the body will be replaced, but right now the soul needs to be renewed. So there's a problem taking place in the realm of the soul and the victory of over sin, the victorious life we're called to live depends upon what happens in the arena of the soul. So let me give you an illustration just to introduce the subject. I will discuss it next week. But here it is. Get this. Anybody here ever had the flu or a cold? What happened? Why did you get ill? Well, there are two reasons you got ill, I think. One is you, got, you, 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 you came into contact with the flu virus or the cold virus, the germ, somewhere, and it entered through one of these openings in your body, your nose, your eyes, your mouth, somewhere, and it got inside of you. Correct? And when the flu virus or the cold virus got on the inside of you, if it stayed there long enough and multiplied enough, it made you sick. Correct? Now, how could you have avoided getting the flu virus or getting the flu or the cold? Basically, there are two ways, I think. One is you could have stayed, avoided being in the place where the virus was. Okay, so let's assume all the virus that contribute to flus and colds are in this room. Well, if you never came into this room and you stayed out there, you'll never get the virus. You'll never get the flu. So one way not to get the flu or the cold is to make sure you never come in contact with it, and you, the virus, and you stay away from it, right? But because it's not always possible because we can't see it and we don't know where it is, we find ourselves inadvertently at some point coming into contact with the virus or with the germ. All right? And many of us have come into contact with the virus or germs today, but not all of us will get sick. Why? Because, thank God for the immune system. Amen. God has equipped your body with the immune system, so even when the virus enters, if the immune system is strong enough, the immune system can catch it capture it and destroy it before it bears fruit. Before it makes you sick, it can be captured and destroyed if your immune system is strong enough and alert enough to take care of it. That's why it's in your interest to have a strong immune system. That's why every flu season they say, take what? Your shots. They're saying this virus is gonna be all over the place. So if you, you don't want to get it, your best chance is to strengthen your immune system and build your immunity. And one of the ways you do it is you take this shot. Correct? So you can either avoid being where the flu virus is or you build your immunity so that it's strong enough so that when the flu virus enters your body, it is captured and destroyed before it makes you sick. Right? Now, if you have the flu virus inside of your body now, it's inside of you, but it's not of you. It's affecting you, but it's not you. It's living in you, influencing you, making you ill, having some bad consequences, but it's not you. It's a virus, something exterior, that has external, that has entered you. Now here is an analogy you need to hear because you may never have heard it like this. Sin and temptations 
are spiritual germs. They are not you in Christ. That's why you can still sin and be holy, righteous and blameless, because you are not the flu virus, you are not the sins you commit, you are not the temptations. And your spirit never participates in it. Your spirit has an immunity to it that's just perfect. So this is what happens. This spiritual germ, temptation, sin. How do you avoid committing sin? There are only two ways, right? One way would be for you to avoid being in the presence of temptation altogether. Unfortunately, you live in a world that's infested by sin and temptations and there's nowhere you can go where sins and temptations are not. So there's no way to escape the presence of temptation and sin in this world. So if you are going to be victorious and live the overcoming life, the only way you can do that is to strengthen your spiritual immune system so that when temptation enters through your senses into your soul, into your mind, your will and emotions, in order to influence your will to sin, your immune system is strong enough spiritually to take it captive and to destroy the temptation before it makes you sin. Amen. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. I told you you need to raise my salary. <laughs> Did you just hear that? Now you understand why you're still holy, still righteous, even though you have a sin or you're struggling with sin because your spirit is perfect but this thing you're dealing with, it's not you. It came from outside, through your senses. It entered not your spirit, which is perfect. It entered your soul, your mind, your will and emotions. And if it stays there long enough and you don't deal with it, it will influence your actions. So what do I need to do in order to live the victorious life over sin? Since I can't escape the presence of sin in this life, I need to strengthen my spiritual immune system so that when temptation comes, it takes it captive and destroys it before it produces sin. And this is what you're doing when you're renewing your mind. You're building your spiritual immune system so that when sin enters your soul, your immune system is strengthened enough to capture it and to destroy it before it leads to sinful action. In perfecting holiness, we need to focus on the arena of the soul. Next week, that's where I'm going to be. And next week, where are you going to be? Oh, you are wonderful. You are wonderful. You are wonderful. Hallelujah. Amen. Say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So, listen, as I bring this to this, this to a conclusion, Paul said, don't be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to this world. Be you transformed. Listen to me. You are not called to be a conformist. Saints, God has called you not to conform. Don't be a thermometer. You are not in this world simply to reflect the climate of this world, to adjust to what's happening around you. You are not in this world to be controlled by the world that you're in. You're not a thermometer. Saints, set apart ones, made holy and blameless, children of God, the temples of the living God. The greater one lives in you. You are called to be a thermostat. You are called to influence the climate, the spiritual climate, to influence the world for Christ, not to be transformed by the world, but to be a change agent in the world wherever you go. And the way you function as a thermostat, changing and influencing your world for Christ, is by the decision you make every day to present. That is what practicing holiness is. It's on a daily basis or moment by moment basis, being aware of who I am, 
presenting my members to Christ in me to be used for his glory, renewing my mind so that I have a strong spiritual immunity against temptation, and then refusing to be conformed to the world. May God grant you and me the revelation we need, the grace we need from this day forward to live our lives in such a way that we're influencing the spiritual climate in our homes, in our families, where we work, where we go to school, for Christ. In Jesus' name. I said in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. This is your reasonable act of worship. Thank God for the worship team and the, what we do for 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour. That's part of what we do. But worship is more than a song. Amen. The greatest act, the, the holiness that we are talking about, the worship God is wanting, the worship that he describes as being spirit and truth, is the worship that takes place every day when you ask the temple of the Holy Spirit, the saints of God, are offering your bodies to him. That is practical holiness. That is practicing holiness. And that is the worship that pleases God. And when you live like this, you become the agent of the Lord to produce radical changes for Christ in this world. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Come on, say hallelujah.